Well, good morning. Many thank you for the kind introduction. Well, um, we just had a breakfast session dealing with uh, upper limb access to peripheral interventions, um, promoting the radial access. Um, I'm still a believer and a user of the brachial access, which is, in my opinion, essential if you are dealing with complex aortoiliac occlusive disease. Um, you can see the uh, p potential advantage coming from the arm. It's basically that you can intervene on both sides of the iliac arteries if they are both affected. So one single access to both um, sides of the iliac arteries, um, no additional femoral access is necessary in most cases. In addition, if you are coming from the arm, you can simply inject some contrast agent in order to uh, identify uh, the common femoral artery for additional retrograde access if needed, if the initially intended single integrate access via the brachial or radial access does fail. Um, besides, of course, injecting contrast medium and uh, nowadays use of ultrasound, it's pretty simple to use fluoroscopy to identify the common femoral artery as an access side artery. Um, the case I'm going to present is um, the one shown here. This is the MR angiography, the baseline angiography showing an infrarenal aortic occlusion involving both common iliac arteries. We can see a nice uh, lumbar artery collateralization to the bilateral iliac bifurcation with retrograde flow coming from the internal iliac arteries going into the external and then down uh, to the leg arteries. Of note, um, there is already some um, tapering of the aortic lumen just uh, below um, the offtake of the renal arteries. This is the corresponding angiogram. A 90 centimeter long six French cheese is inserted via the left brachial excess. Um, the left brachial access is the preferred access to such cases because we spare about 10 centimeters of length coming from the left arm as compared to the right arm and we don't need to cross the offtake of the carotid arteries if we are coming from the left side. So this angiogram basically confirms uh, the finding of the MR imaging. The next step here, this is now um, the um, reconstitution here of the iliac bifurcations. Unfortunately, I could not find the subtracted an, uh, angiogram, so this is unsubtracted angiography, but um, the nice aspect here is that we have bony landmarks. Um, so the first step, um, what I do if I am coming from the upper extremity access, I probe um, first of all if the aorta is occluded. The aortic occlusion, usually this is a very soft occlusion and you are able to cross uh, the aorta in the true lumen. The challenge is then to enter into the um, iliac occlusion and it's not predictable where the guide wire is going to. Is it going to the right or left side? Um, it's helpful to use a diagnostic catheter, um, mainly in my experience, a vertebral configuration of a five French catheter in order to get enough support coming from above. And then I'm trying to introduce a 35,000 stiff glide wire into either of the uh, common iliac arteries. Uh, you will see later on <clears throat> that in this particular patient, the distal aorta, the aortic bifurcation, and both common iliac arteries had been severely calcified. So in this particular case, the guide wire went relatively easy into um, the left common iliac artery and thereafter it was possible also to spontaneously re-enter into um, the external iliac artery. Important here is that you verify your re-entry point into um, the, uh, um, let's say, or um, the level of the re-entry into uh, the iliac bifurcation because what you want to avoid here is um, 
to occlude um, the internal iliac artery. So you have to be sure if you use as a single access um, the anti-grade upper limb access that the reentry level is not distal to the iliac bifurcation because if you then insert stents upstream to the common iliac artery, you will close um, the origin of the internal iliac artery. So after having uh, re-entered um, the iliac bifurcation at the correct level, pre-dilatation was performed also of the external iliac artery because um, even this artery was diffusely diseased, even not having been totally occluded. And um, this was then the angiogram after pre-dilatation of the distal external iliac, uh, including the common femoral artery. Nice uh, uh, to see here that this is also uh, very much calcified at the level of the common femoral artery. Then the next step was to establish a retrograde access. In my experience, um, it's mandatory to use at least two access sites if you are approaching uh, a autoiliac bilateral iliac occlusion. So you have to use the integrate access to approach one of the iliac occlusions, and then you can use the opposite side, in this particular case, uh, the right common femoral artery, to come from retrograde to cross um, the uh, common f uh, iliac artery occlusion retrogradely. Uh, the lesion was predilated using a six millimeter balloon here. Uh, on the left side, another six millimeter balloon coming from um, uh, the arm. Then uh, 19 old stents had been inserted into uh, the proximal external iliac artery extending into the mid part of the left common iliac artery. So the proximal part of the common iliac artery was preserved, but the outflow was um, established and saved by uh, stent implantation. We still, or was still facing this distal occlusion. There was only a very small, tiny lumen uh, with contrast inflow into the left uh, common iliac artery. So um, after probing uh, several times, I was able to connect um, the channel coming from the right common iliac artery with this tiny aortic um, channel from retrograde. Balloon angioplasty was performed of the entire aorta and um, of course of um, both iliac arteries uh, for preparing stent implantation. I know that mainstream uh, currently is to use uh, covered stents or endografts for reconstruction of aortoiliac occlusions. My general approach still is very conservative and cheap. I'm going to use nitinol stents. Here in this particular situation, it's a 40 millimeter smart stent, um, which I did implant directly um, below um, the offspring of the renal artery step by step. Uh, extending um, to the level of the aortic bifurcation. It's important that uh, you don't extend uh, the stent into one of the um, uh, common iliac arteries. Here we can see that the stent just ends at the level of the carina. The next step was then to extend um, the um, left common iliac artery stent towards the iliac bifurcation and to implant also um, bare metal nitinol stents into um, the right common iliac artery. And that's um, basically the background of this reconstruction. So it's a kind of edge kissing stent implantation into the origins of the uh, common iliac arteries. And in addition, a stent is or one or two stents, depending on the available stent length, is implanted into um, the uh, infrarenal aorta. So this was done over here. Um, this is the angiogram of the reconstructed um, um, iliac bifurcation, including the outflow into the external iliac arteries. And you can see that um, both internal iliac artery origins are still widely patent. So the bifurcations had been preserved just in case of reocclusion when these uh, um, arteries are um, of importance again, or may become of importance again. 
Um, this is just uh, to show how the reconstruction of this initial uh, case example did end up also here, kissing stent implantation into the bifurcation, not extending the stents into the aorta. I try to avoid it to preserve the option for an up and over access in the future for such patients. So in summary, a variety of endovascular options exists of, for recanalization of aortoiliac CTOs. Um, bare metal stents, as used here, I am clearly a fan here of using nitinol self-expandable stents. Then we have the parallel stent graft technique, in particular in uh, infrarenal uh, aortic occlusions. Uh, you can implant two wire bound endoprosthesis starting from the origins of the renal arteries down into both um, uh, common iliac arteries. There's CREP stent graft reconstruction. However, no comparative data favors one over the other excess technique so far. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zeller. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to have a discussion here. Let me uh, first uh, start with uh, Dr. White. Um, Dr. White, any concern if when you're reconstructing this complex task, the aortoiliac lesions, of using a covered stent and compromising the collaterals. Is there any concerns about that? Do we need to worry about that? Well, <clears throat> I think there is, Mehdi, and I think Thomas pointed that out. Number one, the first step is remember that the surgeons call the internal iliac the hypogastric artery for a reason. And when you lose a, an internal iliac, um, you potentially jeopardize uh, collateral circulation to the to the bowel, and so it can be very difficult to understand ahead of time what the consequences are of that loss, so working very hard not to lose that collateral supply is important. And then there's the inferior uh, uh, mesenteric artery that arises from the uh, lower part of the aorta that covered stents will sacrifice. It's not such a concern when they're using covered stents for aneurysmal disease, but for aortic uh, occlusive disease, it potentially can be a source of collateralization. So. You want to be aware of, of what you've potentially given up uh, when, when you lose these sources of collaterals. Um, Dr. Farber, uh, what do you think, you know, is there anything you should have available if you're going to tackle this kind of lesions, meaning that are there other tools you should have readily available in your lab or that you know where they are if you're going to take on this level of complex, uh, you know, uh, case? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a really a testament to Dr. Zeller's technical prowess, uh, a beautiful result. Of course, there's a lot of risk involved in doing this. Uh, one major risk is the possibility of rupture of the aorta, which could result in death. So I think in this situation, I would definitely have an endograft available, probably the AFX2, which I will talk about later th uh, this afternoon, uh, just in case you rupture the aorta. Uh, because that's, uh, if that happens, you just don't have a lot of time. Yeah, well, it's absolutely mandatory, of course, if you treat complex aortoiliac lesions that you have access to stent grafts of any kind. So um, perforations can happen. Um, however, they are not uh, essentially linked to such complex reconstructions. Uh, most of my, fortunately, rare iliac ruptures did simply happen during a single vessel re uh, canalization. For example, I external iliac artery uh, ruptures after post dilatation of nitinol stents um, are not uh, uh, unusual. Um, I fortunately never observed any aortic complication when doing such uh, um, aortoiliac recanalizations, but of course they can happen, and if they happen, they are life threatening. So you need to be prepared for these complications. Thomas, uh, thank you for this great case. In order to try and even get a glimpse of what is going on in your mind while you're planning those cases, I have two very specific questions. Yep. One question is that if this case of a distal aortic occlusion had a lot of collateral filling of one of the common femorals into the internal iliac, would you have then tried to cross retrograde getting ultrasound guided access on that common femoral? That's one question. And the second question is that when you advance the guide wire supported with a catheter, are you intentionally trying to re-enter at a particular spot versus when you tactile 
uh, feedback tells you that you have entered the true lumen because we know when we have. I ask this question with the intent that the internal iliac artery is not an easy place to re-enter and the risk of complication is higher. So I want you to give a little deep answer of what is going on in your mind when you're planning these and the access and the re-entry. Yeah, well, key for planning is to have access to CT and geographic um, pre-interventional images. MR and geography as shown over here is not sufficient in my experience. You need to know what's the plaque composition and in particular where the, uh, let's say, the initial culprit lesion is located in terms of where is the most severe calcification located because this is predictive for how you um, may be successful uh, tackling the lesion, whether it's from the antegrade upper arm access. So if, for example, like in this case, it was obvious that the aortic bifurcation was the culprit problem, it was pretty easy to enter the aortic occlusion from above. If it's the opposite, if you see in the CT and geography uh, that it's more likely that the aorta is the culprit problem, it's easier to plan the procedure from the retrograde access. And this is also the answer to your first question. Well, how to initially plan, what to do with uh, collateral filling, refilling, where to, to start to cross the lesion first. So I, I believe that um, analysis of CT and geography is essential before you start such a procedure. Professor Zeller, thank you so much. You so really much. appreciate yeah. it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, the next uh, presentation, uh, just grateful Dr. Tarek Hamad, who has stepped up to the plate. Uh, Dr. Parikh had an emergency back home, so he had to fly this morning back to New York. He's going to be presenting a femoral popliteal CTO. Tarek is a early career, so Dr. White, take it easy on him, please. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the CVI organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, it's a tough spot to fill Dr. Perry, but I'll do my best. I hope you learn something. So today I'm going to talk about a case of femoral popliteal CTO. So briefly, this is a 72-year-old man. Uh, multiple comorbidities, including some dementia, for vessel bypass, indecision, dialysis, BAD, remote uh, second right to amputation, other comorbidities. No reported prior vascular intervention to us. He was actually never seen in our clinic. He was referred by podiatry uh, for a CLI late in May, and he was uh, supposed to see us actually on the 14th of June in the office. However, on the 9th of June, Thursday, we got a text as a, in the vascular group saying this patient food had deteriorated rapidly, Something needs to be done more urgently, and that he probably cannot wait till next week. And uh, he sent us this picture and the uh, text to group message. Very bad looking, you know, gangrene. Probably, you know, soon to turn to wet, involving, you know, I think there's a second toe missing, but the foot is so swollen, the toes are so swollen, don't feel anything missing, but actually there's a second toe missing, that's a prior amputation. And um, very bad looking. So here's the uh, patient had a PBR in April. As you see, the PT, they could not get a signal, so it's not reported. The DP is low at 0 0.62. I think I can see from here, probably 0 0.62. And the, uh, they could not get any signal uh, or uh, waveform in the uh, uh, toes. So it's a flat line, basically, zero. It's a TBI is zero. So Friday, next day, is the 10th. We brought him to the cath lab, um, you know, at uh, UH. Uh, we went uh, from contralateral uh, left CFA axis up and over. Uh, using macropuncture technique, ultrasound fluoro guided. Uh, using IM and uh, uh, catheter woolly wire, we engaged the right common iliac. We took some uh, diagnostic images. As you see, common external internal mild disease, but patent. Uh, second panel, you can see the CFA and the uh, bifurcation of to SFA profunda, heavily calcified, but looks patent overall. Maybe some mild hustle disease of the SFA. Third panel, the SFA, moderate diff diffuse disease, profunda, you see it. And the last panel on the right, you can see there's a CTO of the distal SFA proximal popliteal. Uh, if you can, you know, and I'm not sure if you can appreciate, but in this image, you can see the collateral actually coming from the distal SFA rather than profunda, but you don't see where they're going. So for this reason, we always in CLI case, as I, I was, uh, you know, taught and trained, we like to get selective images, and we usually place the MP, change the IM to MP, place at ZFA level, because Profunda most of the time we provide the collateral, but in this case actually went down all the way to the SFA. So MP placed at the mid to distal SFA, we took some selective images, 
and you can see extensive collaterals. I'm not sure if it's hard to see, but you can see there's some reconstitution at the uh, proximal 80. Uh, the ostal 80 is occluded. Uh, there is also a hint of TPT, but you know you see some peroneal, you can see the PT, and the uh, one on the right side, you can see the uh, AT coming down to the foot through the DP, peroneal, and the PT re -occludes. So at this point, you know, the proximal uh, cap did not look uh, bad for the CTO, but there were extensive collaterals. The target was suboptimal, which is the AT small vessel, uh, but we still decided to give it a shot, you know, try for a short period of time uh, crossing anti-grade. Uh, so we used um, a stiff angle line just to go through the pop. Actually, it went very easy. So once we reached uh, close to the uh, 80, we decided to exchange to a command wire. We tried 018, 014 with a support catheter, uh, could not cross. Um, you know, our strategy was always you give it 5, 10 minutes, maximum 15 minutes, and we switched to retrograde. So we obtained sheathless uh, retrograde. I'm not sure if you can appreciate the uh, microcast in the uh, all panels from the retrograde uh, with the wire. Uh, so she's led through the PD, um, uh, 014 command, and 018 uh, microcatheter support. And from anti-grade, we had the Navi cross. And you can see we crossed, we had some difficulty, but you can see in the third panel, we crossed retrograde uh, from AT, the awesome AT, back to the, up to the popliteal. And they were next to each other, but they did not feel they were, in, they were interacting with each other. So here, you know, I was very confident the way the wire felt that the uh, anti-grade, I'm a true lumen, but honestly retrograde because we had, we struggled a little bit. I was not sure if I'm a true lumen beyond the AT. Uh, so I decided to proceed with a card. So I put a balloon the, uh, on the uh, retrograde wire. Um, and uh, basically, you know, we tried to, uh, you know, uh, uh, re-enter from, of course, before doing this, I forgot to mention, we had uh, tried to connect to uh, 250T wire, trying to re-enter lumen did not work. So we decided to proceed with card. We ballooned, retrograde, you know, trying to connect the two wires is not working. So we used a parallel balloon technique. We had balloon from the top, balloon from the bottom. And here I was a little bit, you know, start to question myself. There is some radiolucency between the two balloons. And there's all these stables. But I looked up at the side, and there are no stables at all anywhere else. So I honestly started to wonder about having bypass. Remember, this patient never seen in the office. We asked him. He said he's not sure if he had bypass. He does not think so. He had a heart bypass, but he's not aware of leg bypass. But all these stables, I didn't see any stables up you know, in the thigh. So I said, and I looked at his groin. And honestly, there was no scar in the groin. I said, maybe he never had bypass. So we, you know, we tried to do this parallel balloon technique at different levels. You know, uh, we went up a little bit, took some risk, went up a little bit because I was not sure of my, my retrograde wire. I was honestly puzzled and confused and a little bit, you know, afraid. But throughout the procedure, he never had really pain with all this balloon inflation. So we went up, uh, you know, at the distal SFA level, and you can see the uh, radiolucency, you know. And uh, it looks like the balloons, I mean, even if they're different planes, you know, still usually suppose those, those are five or six or balloons, they're supposed to touch each other in the SFA, but did not. We did one more balloon, um, you know, and the, um, the uh, balloons actually were close to each other, but still did not connect. So at this point of time, I felt, you know, I'm going to try re-entry device where these balloons were in, co in contact with each other. So I upsized the retrograde uh, DP axis to six of French, took an outback re-entry device. And I did uh, use a facilitated re-entry technique where I puncture, you know, the balloon from the anti-grade and uh, which I know it for sure 100% was the true lumen. And I thread the wire through the uh, outback re-entry and uh, basically, you know, now with true lumen. So what we did at this point of time, we pulled the balloon, the anti-grade balloon, and we pushed the wire from the retrograde trying to externalize the wire. To be, you know, and honestly, I forgot to mention, now we're like a three hours into the procedure. This was not like a half an hour, one hour, one hour and a half. This was three hours into the procedure. And my fellow was telling me, you know, maybe we should stop, but we got lucky and we crossed. And they told him, listen, we just crossed. I'm not stopping. And there were other people waiting and, you know, there was some push to finish. I said, we just crossed. I mean, we have to finish the work. We cannot just leave him. So um, uh, next. To be lucky again, you know, fellow King Zawar is his pushing to externalize. So we had to snare Zawar using, uh, you know, a seven millimeter snare. We externalize Zawar, we exchange uh, to basically platinum plus, and we proceed with the intervention. I'll show you next image. Okay, this is balloon of the um, uh, SFA. I was not sure what I am, but again, throughout the procedure, the patient had no pain. I was very comfortable. There is no damage, there is no complication. Balloons at SFA, balloon below at the pop level, balloons at 80. And um, here's the next set of images. So you see the SFA, second panel. From the left, you see the SFA. 
and it looks like there is a bypass. And, um, you know, and the third panel sees that bypass feeds the AT. So it looks like he had distal SFA to AT bypass, which honestly, I never seen in my life. I never seen distal SFA bypass. Um, and again, but again, you know, uh, short experience. So I'm not sure maybe others can comment. And uh, the third set of image, you can see that AT looks okay. You know, there is a huge dissection at the pop level, at the pop level, which is in the SVG. There's some dissection at the AT level or prior to that. And the DP looks bad, but I think, you know, I was pushing with the gauze because I removed the six French sheet and I think it spasmed. At this point of time, believe it or not, we're like four an hour and a half into the procedure. I said, you know, we got to stop. There are other cases needs to go outpatient. So we decide to stop and bring the patient uh, in one week. So this is the 20th of uh, June. This is not the Monday following, but the Monday after. And uh, luckily, you know, nothing had gone down. The uh, SVG work takes off the distal SFA is very tight. Uh, but actually, the AT is still open, and the DP looks much better. I'm sure we can appreciate the DP looks much better, no longer spasm, not disease, as it, uh, it is before. Uh, so at this point of time, we crossed that tight uh, SVG takeoff with a command. Omon 8 was very easy with the support microcatheter. We re-ballooned. We did not do DCB this time because we just did DCB 10 days ago. And I deployed a super across that SVG uh, in the third panel, and then I deployed a self-expanding stand from the distal SFA uh, into the uh, SVG. So I think was five, five by 60, and the uh, self-expanding was, I think, six oh by 80. And these are the final pictures. I'm sorry, it seemed like the first one is not playing. I'm not sure why it looks like more still image. Uh, SFA still has some mild to moderate diffuse disease, nothing severe, you know. SVG looks good. And I'm sorry, somehow the a picture of the Supera did not, yeah, did not. And this is the last uh, final foot picture. So. Uh, if follow-up actually was supposed to see me last week, past Tuesday, he rescheduled for next Tuesday. We don't have ABI, TBI because this procedure, unless patients stay in-house, we don't get ABI till one month afterwards as a follow-up. So take-home messages for me were, you know, history and key, uh, history and exam are key, like everything else in medicine. You got to know your patient. This patient was not in the office, was not evaluated. A little bit we cut corners, but you got to talk to the patient, talk to the family, talk to the referring physician. Review prior records, prior angiogram. Examine the patient. Honestly, the patient had a scar mid-tie, which I never looked at, and this is my fault. N neither the fellow nor anybody else. So if we looked at his uh, thigh, we saw the mid-tie scar, maybe we could have figured it out. Look careful for stables, for calcium. I think I made a mistake. I uh, put the re-entry device through the retrograde. It was unnecessary, in my opinion. And I reviewed the case with Dr. Shishabur later. I could have done you know, uh, the uh, re-entry from the contralateral axis. And, uh, and one advice, and Dr. Shabur always tell me, stage procedure if you can and if appropriate. Uh, you know, you cannot do six, seven hour procedure, uh, especially starting uh, early on, you know, so stage when you can. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tariq, great job, great job. And thanks for, uh, you know, being so uh, humble and honest and careful. I, I think that's, that's why you're so great. You know, I, uh, uh, Sherling, uh, you know, we, you know, this is always an issue in my mind, and I'm just very, very interested to see what the panel thinks um, when do you stop, especially when you're early career, and when you know, you're concerned because you want to get the job done, you know, you know that whatever you did in that pop, whether it was the uh, SVG bypass, whatever it was, that that was not going to be patent for a long time. He's already four or five hours into the procedure. Um, how, what do you do? What is your advice uh, and the panel's advice? Uh, maybe we can ask everybody in regards to what should you do uh, and what strategies for the, you know, uh, the early career folks that are trying to uh, push the envelope, take care of these patients, but also want to be careful, not cause damage to the patient, but also their reputation in their hospital and those kind of things. Yeah, I think that's a, a good question, and it's always a, a bit of a struggle to know, like, when is it okay to say, oh, well, maybe better to, you know, survive to fight another day. Um, and I think it really is dependent on the case. I mean, there are some cases where, you know, we try endo first, but there's clearly a bailout, like there's a surgical option. And in those cases, you know, I usually say, we're going to give this a good effort for endo, but if I end up like outside of the vessel, you know, we're trying to cross a CTO and the wire is clearly outside, or we've struggled for an hour and the patient is kind of like wriggling off the table, then, I'm, then it, we just have to stop there and move on. And either, and that point, um, 
and like, well, maybe someone else can try it, or we're just gonna go do the bypass. So oftentimes for these cases, um, I'll vein map them first. Unless they're like an impossible surgical candidate, usually for these CTOs, especially if they're involving the popliteal, I'll vein map them and work them up to see if there's any uh, sort of bypass option, because that really does affect how long we try for the endo stuff. If there's no bypass option, then you know, we'll try pretty hard. But if there's gonna be some open option, then that, that will affect oftentimes how long we'll, we'll persist at this. So, Mary, I would just say it's important for youngsters, but it's also important for all of us to never be sort of walking out on a plank and having no, no help, right? You need to always be able to either call a friend or, or ask, you know, is, is Dr. So-and-so in the lab next door? Can he come in and take a look at this? As operators, we get committed to finishing. We get committed to winning. We get committed to, I can, you, you kind of make this a battle against the disease and, and, and you get so wrapped up, you often, you tend to go too far. And an independent set of eyes, someone that you respect, can walk into the room and say, no, 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 stop. You know, we need to do this, or have you thought of that? I mean, I find that, that a, a disinterested party uh, can provide tremendous help to me, um, and certainly to younger folks, about options and about not pushing too far. Uh, you know, the old saying is when you get in a hole, stop digging. The trouble is when you're the guy at the end of the catheter, it's hard sometimes to know uh, when you're in a hole. So youngsters who are taking jobs, try not to be in a place where you're isolated, right? You don't want to be the only person in the lab that day. That is a very difficult position for someone of limited experience to be in. It's difficult for all of us, but certainly someone who's, you know, not done 100 cases yet, you don't want to be the only guy in the OBL uh, and, and stuck like this. So um, make sure you're looking for uh, who you can talk to and who can bail you out. Thank you, Chris. I think a lot of good advice has been given, and the intent of this forum is to try and get into the minds of uh, the operator and have them answer questions. But Tarek, I should tell you that you have you pretty much answered the comments that I actually had during the case, and I want to commend you on deep, insightful self-reflection and also being open to discussing that case after a few things you said during the case were very pivotal, I think, in my mind. And you rationalized your approach, why you continue to why you not. So I, I think that is the most fair way I can tell you. Uh, technically, I want to ask you that if you actually went contralateral and you were not, you ended up near that vein graft anastomosis, and I'm challenging you and my colleague, Dr. Shashibo, here, how would you have dealt with that? I'm not so sure that it would be the easiest approach if you end up outside the lumen near the graft anastomosis and you are coming from the left groin, it would be far more challenging. So I think that, that your approach might be the better one. So that debate will continue. But your few minutes of thoughts, what you would do in an alternate situation like this, and then we'll move on to the next one. You mean if it would have approached differently or? Yes, from the contralateral. Coming from anti-grade yes. accuracy, you mean? Yes. Honestly, I, you know, we didn't have prior angiogram or CTA, so I did not have any idea no how idea. the SFA looks like. Uh, but generally speaking, if I had prior angiogram, I mean, the way the SFA looked, actually, I did a pressure pull back across it because I was suspicious the ocular SFA is diseased. Yes. So I think in this specific case, I would still have one, uh, gone, uh, contralateral and uh, retrograde. Okay. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's move on to the next case. We are going to invite Dr. Peter Monteleone, a uh, dear colleague from Ascension Heart from Dell Medical School in Texas to talk about a BTK CTO. He will describe his case, his technical thoughts, and then we'll have some great questions for him. Peter, delighted that you're here. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, obviously, just an honor to, to speak to this group and this panel. We're going to talk about more than kind of a single case. I'm, I'm going to lay out my, my algorithm for BTK CTO, and I'm going to try to embed some of the kind of the key clinical questions within a number of different uh, below knee chronic total occlusions. So these are my disclosures. So again, we'll talk about my toolkit. We'll talk about how I divide up kind of anatomic territories for decision making. We'll talk about eventual destination therapies and why I use some things in one place and some in another. 
From a toolkit standpoint, you, you, you pick a sheath, right? For BTK CTO, you'll see for some folks that shy away from getting sheaths down distal into the popliteal because they're worried about distal perfusion, but you really do need the support, especially when you're working for distal CTO. It's important, especially early on, to remember that if you have too long a sheath and it's hanging out of the hip, 20 centimeters as you're going up and over, you lose that distance. And so as you're trying to get into the pedal loops or if you're trying to work distally, you gotta make sure that you're, you, you've got as much but not too much access as you work through. For me and my algorithm, we talked a lot about this yesterday in the, in the wonderful panels, including led by Dr. Banerjee. Um, I use a, a small 014 Nitrix wire. Nitrix is a night and all cord um, a wire with a silicon coating in it. It's got this gold tungsten coiled wrap, which makes it easy to see for what it's worth. It's also relatively inexpensive and a good supportive workhorse peripheral wire. In the tibials, I use an 014 Nitrix through an 018 Trailblazer microcatheter. 018 gives you a little more ability to, to push compared to the 014s, which collapse quite easily when you're working across a CTO. 018s also give you the ability to add CTO tips to wires, and so you can put a CTO tipped wire down through that catheter. In terms of my wire escalation, I start with that workhorse. I start with that small loop on that workhorse. If I can see a microchannel, I'm very quick to drop a Fielder XT down it. And this is a good example of what looks like a long, maybe total occlusion, but there's a microchannel there, and that Fielder XT just flies down through it, makes this actually a pretty straightforward case. So I keep that in mind. You know, rarely do I do really uh, aggressive up titration to stiff, heavy tipped wires. If I need something for a short CTO or I decide that's my right answer, I just use a Confianza Pro 12 with that one millimeter 45 degree tip. Or you can use the end tier wire. You know, I don't use the end tier balloon um, that much in tibials as I will in other areas. That balloon system is similar to the stingray system in coronaries. It allows for balloon reentry. But I will use that wire quite a bit. You know, that wire gets described as a micropuncture needle on a wire. It is really, really stiff and it will go somewhere. That is for darn sure. So you don't use it to try to find a long path, but you can use it to poke through a cap. As I've gone on in my career, I've gotten quicker and quicker to swap over to retrograde axis. For me, um, I try to avoid sheathing if I can. I do a lot of uh, kind of sheathless work from below and attempt to use that just to find wire passage. I do use this cooked tibia pedal kit. And you'll see that in all these cases as we go through. But for me, I use the needle, then I use the, um, ultra, the micropuncture wire that comes with the kit, and then I'll always just put the dilator, not the actual sheath, over that micropuncture wire. Through that dilator, I'll try to work. And if I can get my V18, which is my typical retro wire, up through the dilator, that's all I'm ever going to put in. There's never going to be a sheath. If that wire doesn't cross on its own, then I'll go in with the full cook tibia pedal sheath. That sheath will also let an 018 CXI catheter go up, gives you more support if you're knuckling with an 018 wire and also lets you do wire exchange. If it doesn't cross, um, as was discussed yesterday, I'm, I'm really a believer in if you can do that kind of rendezvous wire to wire technique, wonderful. If you can't, you have the ability to do cart or reverse cart. Use a balloon either going antegrade or retrograde to open a path that you can then pass through from the other direction. Um, you gotta be cautious about it in certain areas. You certainly don't wanna be ballooning in the extravascular space in the popliteal if you can avoid it. IVIS is an addition to cart or reverse cart. If you can prove that both wires are intraluminal, you can cart all day long and find yourself a nice path. So this was a nice cart case. You know, I'll, I'll use, uh, especially when we start talking anatomically about trifurcation obliteration or when we start talking about total occlusions of the popliteal expending, extending into the vessels. It's a real hard cases to cross from above. And this was a nice case with retrograde axis, a balloon that came up from the foot, just a coronary to a balloon, allowing that wire passage down distally. After you connect, you've got some options. You can snare and you can externalize. You know, more commonly these days, I'll try to do that rendezvous technique or wire snare where you get the wires to interact. And if you bring a microcatheter up from the foot, that creates a channel. And oftentimes an 014 balloon can travel antegrade through a channel that was crossed retrograde by an 018 uh, a microcatheter. So key points, um, once if you're working retro, once you're across a lesion before you've opened the vessel, pull the retro sheath. So before you open up and establish your channel of flow, pull that sheath, hold pressure, it'll give you the chance to actually get your hemostasis. And so dive in into some of these cases as we go. So again, trifurcation obliteration, very hard to cross antegrade. I'm quicker in that setting to transition to retro. If I'm going retro, I'm more likely to pick the posterior tibial because it'll give me a little bit of a straighter shot without those 90 degree bends through the anterior tibial. And this was a case where we had a TP total occlusion. We have an AT occlusion with a big uh, collateral coming off it. We were able to cross this one antegrade just with that nitrix wire. And so it leads to the question of, well, what will you do technically working inside of a trifurcation? Um, here, that wire, when it first passed, it went into the perineal. And we, we talked extensively about the data-free zone for, for atherectomy in general in some of these situations or the data-limited zone. That limitation is even more severe when you start talking below knee. 
But if you're thinking about a territory to use it, trifurcation, where balloon angioplasty is going to push plaque across to the other side of the vessel, it's a really good setting to start thinking about utilization of particularly directional atherectomy. This situation, we've pushed a Hawk 1S, their six French smaller vessel size device, down across the TP trunk, and it not only opened up that TP, not only opened up the origin of that perineal, but if anything, it just debulked the ostea of the posterior tibial. You certainly could have tried to rewire, but then you get in the same situation of giving up versus one versus the other. After that, we turned our attention to the AT. Um, quickly and smoothly, we moved that nitrix through that 018 over into the anterior tibial. It didn't cross completely. You'll see on this pic these pictures, it got part of the way down, and then we got to that kind of tough fibrotic distal cap, which we punctured with a Confianza Pro 12. Even though we had a directional atherectomy device open, the AT bend is absolutely not somewhere you want to run a directional atherectomy device of any atherectomy device. So he's a chalk balloon. We'll talk a little bit about chocolate balloons down in that bend and had a really nice result. So we went from kind of multiple little areas of occlusion within the TP trunk, the ostea, the PT, and then a true occlusion in the AT, and our runoff at the end looked quite good. So reconstitution of the trifurcation. As we come farther down, we have nice three-vessel runoff, and most importantly, as we get all the way down into the foot, we've got a really good pedal archery constitution. So again, in t terms of anatomic considerations, that AT 290 degree bend is also an area where the media is weak as the artery passes through the interosseous membrane. Um, so be careful there when you're doing different things. Be careful there if you're thinking about carding or reverse carding, try to do it away from that bend because that is an area that's susceptible to rupture which can cause compartment syndrome. As for destination therapies across all these uh, situations and cases, you know, very little for stents, um, but sometimes you need a stent. And so quickly, this was a case we used the same algorithm. We got up and across from below, and we couldn't uh, cross this PT occlusion from above. And very clearly, we had a dissection at the reentry site. Um, I visited it to see if that dissection was started at the TP trunk or if it was started at the origin of the PT, because that's how we have decisions about what we can do. And we see very clearly that the origin of the PT looked good. Within a centimeter of the PT, we were inside of a flap. And then at the TP trunk termination, we're, we're true lumen into the PT. We can try ballooning it, and we did. So this is how terrible it looked before. We tried prolonged balloon inflation with a nanocross balloon. Distally, there was flow, but the flap looked terrible. We tried a prolonged balloon uh, inflation, and it looked worse, not better. Um, that's a good situation where you start thinking about stenting. So we had IVIS sizing for our stents. We put a 3533 down across the lesion. We took a little cheat picture to make sure that we weren't occluding the TP trunk. We fluoro saved it because we weren't. And then we post dilated after I. So this is immediately after the stent. We IVIS after the stent. We could get bigger proximally. So we put a 40 balloon down, just a 20 NC coronary balloon to post dilate it. And it turned out pretty great. So not much data for stents, but if you're going to stent, Optimize your size. Tibials always tend to be bigger than we think they will be. Um, less metal is more, and so IVIS before and IVIS after. Chocolate balloons we use a lot of, and just to talk a little bit about the technology that's featured on the escalator here at CVI, I think. So ch chocolate balloons are these um, balloons which are constrained within a night and all cage. And so very quickly, you can kind of see how that balloon inflates, maybe. So on the left side is a normal balloon. As it opens, it twists. It, there's that torsional force causing dissection. The goal with the night and all cage is to kind of constrict that twist. And so little pillows come out through the balloon and try to limit dissection. There's some registry prospective data with a great name, chocolate bar. Um, 260 below knee, or 220 below knee, 260 above knee patients, and the main goal was just avoiding flow limiting dissection. And so it did quite well from that. So bailout stenting freedom was 99%, freedom from flow limiting dissection, at least in that registry, uh, which was fairly complex cases, was 100%. So at the end of the day, it's a balloon. So this was a case where there was a, a PT occlusion, there was a perineal occlusion, there was an AT occlusion. We put a wire across one, we ballooned it. We put a wire across the other, we ballooned it. We put a wire down across everything and we ended up with full runoff to the foot. So a good example of how kind of a somewhat advanced technology within balloon angioplasty can let us get a really good dissection-free result. We're waiting data from Saval. I, I don't have too much personal experience, but you can't not mention this self-expanding stent based on alluvia technology, which is being integrated into baloney intervention. Novel, kind of thoughtful utilization of device, and we're excited to see uh, how that comes into use. So in conclusions, um, went through a bunch of different cases, rapid fire, but tried to focus on the key points from those cases. They're all based on that same toolkit, and the more consistent that toolkit is, the more efficient that toolkit is. Be comfortable with retrograde axis. Be comfortable with when the retrograde wire doesn't fly if you're rendezvousing or if you're carting. Uh, think about the anatomic caution in the AT bend as well as in obliterated trifurcations. There's some benefits to debulking in the trifurcation with all the caveats that come along with utilization of atherectomy in general. We've got much more to learn about baloney and what our final treatment is. So thank you all.
Thank you, Peter. Before, thank you. Before you can leave, a quick rapid-fire questions for you. Please. Um, I think I'm sure these questions arise in the minds of every operator, and then we'll go across to the panel. Is that if your guide wire crossing anti-grade uh, goes in and out the true lumen of a tibial vessel, uh, you probably care for it. Do you want to know it, or you just keep going and ballooning with long balloons over long periods of time? That's one question. And number two, what is your go-to general male patient balloon size? Because I think a lot of data has come out of undersizing uh, tibial balloons. So those are two quick questions for a you. Absolutely. So part, part of the question, um, there's always a spectrum there for what's out and what's really out and what was out a little bit and maybe back. If I have a relatively smooth cross, I always just will start with angioplasty, long angioplasties, and um, you know maybe longer angioplasties to tack up areas if you need to. We hate using stents even when you know if we cause big dissections in legs, but we, we can. Um, so so most commonly in a tibial vessel, I'm not going to start thinking, well, can I push an ibis down this to prove which area was true lumen and which wasn't until I, I'm, I feel like I've been out of the vessel for quite quite some distance along the way. Um, I am, in my algorithm, very quick to try to move retrograde, which usually helpfully gives you a more understanding of a kind of true lumen presence along a length. But if I'm passing a long distance anagrade where I think outside of that's where I, that's where I start worrying before I just start ballooning about what to do. Um, quickly, in terms of balloon size within the tibial vessels, um, I, I, I try to stay at three and above. You know, if I'm working down into the foot in diffuse disease, that's where I'll start pulling out, you know, maybe two O's and two fives and things. But in a world where we used to use a lot of two O and two five balloons and in, in big males on the table, now a lot of those kind of proximal ATs are three fives. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me ask a question from Dr. White. You know, sometimes in this uh, calcified elderly patients, especially if they have end stage renal disease, you know, you are lucky you pass the wire, but then you can't get anything through. Um, what do you suggest, Dr. White, in these cases when you're doing these tibial calcified lesions? So, Mehdi, I think that um, you do whatever you have to do, right? I mean, I think that we all have a broad uh, or big toolbox full of devices that can assist the heavily calcified lesions. And I don't really have trouble um, at all. I have no criticism at all with whatever you think will work in that, uh, you know, one, two, or three percent of cases that just can't be done. Where I have trouble is when you start to get this, in, uh, this indication creep into lesion preparation that may or may not be necessary, and we just don't have that information. Um, and so I, I think the point and what I try to tell my folks is when you're doing a case, you do whatever you need. If you need a rotoblader, that's fine. If you think you need atherectomy, go to see a psychiatrist. If you think you need, uh, you know, IVL, I mean, do whatever you need to do. But if you're starting to find 30, 40, 50 percent of your tibial cases, you're using these tools for lesion preparation. I think you need to rethink what the data actually says or, it, or collect data, right? Contribute to the science. But the anecdotal stuff of a balloon with a bunch of pillows is somehow better than a balloon without pillows. The only thing better is it costs you more money. Um, the idea, we've been doing 50 years of teleologic explanation of why a device should work, razor blades on a balloon. Um, you know, even, even in 2010 when I, had the, when I had CCI Journal, I was still getting case reports of, of cutting balloons in restenosis. Well, let me tell you, there's never been a case report or any data to suggest that cutting balloons is effective for restenosis. But yet people still want to make that true because it's, in their own mind, it sounds like that's something that ought to work. So have the discipline to participate in registries, randomized controlled trials if possible, uh, and just question yourself uh, if you find this, this indication creep for some of these cool devices that are very expensive but may not be yielding better outcomes. Let me, let me follow that with Dr. Farber. You know, he's also a trialist. One of the challenges, I mean, I agree with Dr. White in principle, but one of the challenges uh, with some of these ancillary adjunctive devices is the incremental benefit, right? You know, if you truly, I mean, are you going to do a randomized trial of, let's say, pillow, you know, chocolate balloon versus regular angioplasty? What would be your outcomes? How would you measure it? All the, you know what I mean? So how do we advance the science? but at the same time be scientific about it. 
Uh, this is really a challenge I think many of us feel because we want to advance the science, we want to move you know, and learn more with these technologies. Uh, but at the same time, we know that a lot of the benefit is incre incremental. Well, how do you deal with it? Because even IVL, I mean, yesterday, I asked, sorry, even the IVL, yesterday, Dr. White, you weren't here, we had a panel of eight or nine, you know, attendings, you know, here, on the, here at the podium, and I asked, give me one device that has changed your practice. You were here, Dr. Farber. I said, give me one device that has changed your practice in the last five years. And uh, five of the eight said IVL. And the other three said IVL, DCB and IVL. I don't see the data myself, to be honest with you, even with IVL for TBLs and SFA. So I don't know how IVL suddenly became, you know, has more data than atherectomy. I know we are anti-atherectomy per se. So I just am struggling myself, to be honest with you. Well, I think you bring up a really good point. I mean, the reality is there are all these new devices uh, that are available to us, and it's exciting. It's, it's, a, it's a really exciting time to be in this space where all new devices are coming in, and you can use them, and it's kind of cool to use them, and you might be the first person in your uh, state to use them, and that, that's so on and so forth. But a lot of these devices are brought to market based on certain parameters that the companies need to be able to market the device and then sell it. And, and so the studies that are out there, many of them are really, uh, the purpose of them is to bring the device to market and do what the FDA needs them to do. The reality is we need uh, to ask questions that clinically are meaningful to us. And that's difficult to do because there's not a lot of money to fund that, right? You can decide, we, you and I can get together and decide on the next 10 trials that are actually meaningful uh, clinically uh, but again, not a lot of money to fund that. It's very difficult to get that funded, but that's what's needed, honestly. We, ask, we, ask, we have to ask the right clinical questions and, and, and participate in trials to answer them. But I will just say to the funding issue is, uh, did anybody have any trouble with funding for drug-coated balloons? Did we not get 35 randomized trials in a period of 18 months? And was that not because drug-coated balloons work? So when you see a paucity of funding or sponsorship for a device, it's because the company doesn't have a lot of confidence that this device will work, or obviously they would stake this claim. So they'd much rather use marketing and registries that are skewed by patient selection to promote those to you rather than to do the hard work and fund the trials that would demonstrate there's true uh, benefit in that space. Professor Zoe? Professor Zeller, let me give you this mic because that mic is not working and we can't hear you. So DCP is an excellent uh, example why it's ob obviously not sufficient to collect randomized control data. Uh, for DCP, we have the most profound evidence that they are better than plain balloons. But how do you explain that there is no reimbursement for DCB use in, in OBLs in the US. Well, we, we all, I also support uh, running randomized controlled studies to show efficacy. And then if you have the data, they are not reimbursed, why? So um, the system needs to be changed as long as devices are reimbursed with no data and others that have data, uh, it cannot work. So what, what we are intending to show that the technology is sufficient is not supported by the government or by the payers, and this is, uh, this is a mistake in our system. Dr. Zeller, I just want to add, I think this is a serious debate, and one of uh, uh, Peter's slides has triggered this very fantastic <laughs> uh, uh, exchange. I just want to add, and maybe you'll agree or not, I think in principle what Dr. White is actually saying, and let me, and he can disagree with me, is that the pivotal question asked during an IDE study is not whether uh, this application is meaningful for clinical application. It is designed to answer the question, can the device purpose as a minimally safe device? The real application of the device or any technology is not being tested part of this. So I think what would help is to remove the word trial or study from those kinds of nomenclatures because <laughs> it is very misleading when these studies are get titled as trials. A trial should be a clinical experiment which is controlled, however it is designed to answer 
a clinical application rather than the technologi technological preferences of a device itself. And I think that would really help. So this nomenclature of study versus trial is really, if you give it a number, device X ISO X13.43, it will not become be presented as evidence. And I think that would be a meaningful change in the future. But, but, I, but I think that your point, Professor Zeller, and you know, it's uh, really a good one, to be honest with you, and I think uh, it's discouraging. It's been discouraging for me that, as Dr. White mentioned, we have a number of randomized clinical trials supporting a technology that is superior, and most of us think is meaningful, and, and we have long-term data, because when we have short-term, they say short. We get long-term, they say it's not long enough. We have long-term data. We have trials, they say we don't have real world. We have everything, and yet it's not reimbursed. So as a company, I mean, we have to be fair, I think. You know, and, uh, and when we have this kind of discrepancy in decision making, it makes it hard. Anyway, uh, good discussion. Thank you so much, Great Peter. Job. Good Thank job. You, man. Very much. you always cause a problem. You see? <laughs> Thanks. So the next one, again, uh, we want to thank Dr. Yulanka Castro Dominguez, uh, also stepping up to the plate uh, from uh, University Hospitals, uh, covering Dr. Sahil Parikh. She's also early career, and uh, she's going to be presenting extreme calcification in the spirit of atherectomy. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. These are my disclosures. So vascular calcification remains to be a challenge for all of us to treat peripheral artery disease. And we know that uh, when we look at vascular calcification and where it occurs, we know that it can happen in the intima, which classically, you know, produces a classically obstructive atherosclerotic plaque. And then we see the medial calcification, which is, which commonly happens in the abdominal and lower extremity uh, arteries, which results in arterial stiffening and decreased compliance. And we see that its prevalence increases with age, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. Now, we know that presence of PAD correlates with cardiovascular mortality, but vascular calcification carries a separate additional risk of mortality and limb loss. And in addition to being a, tr uh, a treatment challenge, it's also a diagnostic challenge because it, it produces non-compressible vessels that lead to non-diagnostic ABIs and may limit the diagnostic accuracy of ultrasound, the shadowing of the lumen, as well as CTA, and even angiography, which m sometimes we can miss even orthogonal calcium. In terms of revascularization, vascular calcification is associated with more procedural complications and long-term tre treatment failure. It can even theoretically may decrease the efficacy of drug-coated balloons due to reduced absorption of the antiproliferative drug. In terms of the options that we have to treat uh, severe calcification, we have atherectomy devices, which was discussed at length during this conference. That includes directional, rotational, orbital, laser. Uh, also, the new kid in the block is intravascular dotripsy, which theoretically, uh, it, its goal is to modify calcified plaques by delivery of very short bursts of very high pressure uh, to the vessel wall through a low-pressure fluid-filled balloon inflation. And then we have our scaffolds, drocolina stents, bare metal stents, uh, cover stents, and even for those cases of very severe calcified vessels, we can use a technique, a pave and crack technique, uh, where, the, where we use a cover stent to line up the vessel and then uh, be able to do high-pressure balloon inflations in a safe manner. So I have a couple of cases to show. First is of an 84-year-old woman with a history of breast cancer <coughs> on chemotherapy, uh, prior pulmonary embolism on, on anticoagulation, uh, presenting with a non-healing second toe wound with an exposed bone that needs an amputation. Uh, and it's been referred to us after a prior unsuccessful intervention. And we can see here ABI is about 0.5 on the left, and TBS are about 0.24. <coughs> So we take it for angiogram, knowing that she had a prior, prior unsuccessful intervention. We go anterograde on the left leg. We see where they, uh, her SFA has uh, diffuse disease. It was previously treated. Uh, but our target at this moment is that uh, uh, mid popliteal occlusion. And we can see that in below, the below the knee vessels, a severe disease, mainly collaterals. And when we look closer in the distal, uh, when we look at the ankle, the, main, the only the single runoff is actually the peroneal artery. So this is what we're dealing with, a pretty challenging um, uh, case. And we can't really appreciate it on the DSA, but there's severe calcification at the level of the popliteal artery. 
So knowing that uh, she had a prior uh, unsuccessful attempt, we go directly to get our perineal access first, actually. So we, uh, we get perineal access using uh, micropuncture and ultrasound, and no, just um, uh, x-ray, not ultrasound, for perineal access in this case. Uh, and then we can see, I don't know if it's plain, how we advance an 018 Can you, can you play the second panel, please, our, our team back there in the AV, if you can just play that video, the second. Thank you Perfect. so much. Thank you so much. How we advance an 018 wire with a 018 microcatheter all the way uh, to the proximal peroneal artery to the popliteal. And can you play the third picture? And we're trying to follow the calcification all the way to the pop, okay? Um, but we notice with our wire that we really we're, it's, we're not really lining up to the calcium and the pop. Okay. So we're not, I'm not really happy where my wire is at this moment, ret retrograde. So then I go um, use another no one eight antigrade wire. Okay. So no one eight command at this moment with a no one eight microcatheter. And then try to see if my two wires meet, my retrograde and my antigrade wire meet. Um, and first I see that my retrograde wire, I don't like where it's going if you guys see the first picture. Uh, and then, so next, I try to go with my antigrade wire, give it another, give it, give it a chance at this moment uh, with the antigrade wire. And we're actually able to cross. By using the retrograde wire as a marker at this moment, I'm, a, I'm able to push and able to actually get into the peroneal artery at this moment. So the retrograde wire worked really well as a marker. At this moment, I was able to treat the peroneal artery with balloon angioplasty and then the, the puppy teal with a duck coated balloon. So now we have inline flow. There's some dissection in the pop. Um, and in order to kind of very secure my inflow, um, we, we actually put a drug gluting stent at the distal popliteal artery uh, in order to secure the inflow. Uh, and then we have a really good inline flow all the way from the peroneal artery. And our ABI's post procedure were actually one. Uh, and she went for her second toe amputation and is healing well. Another, uh, another case of uh, severe classification is of a 90-year-old man with non-healing necrotic foot ulcers, as we can see in this picture. Uh, ABI's are severely reduced and TBS are flat line. Can you play the first panel, please? Thank you. So in this angiogram, we see that there's severe diseases, or severe focal stenosis. It's also highly calcified. We can appreciate that really well in the DSA at the mid-SFA. And there's severe disease uh, uh, below the knee as well with uh, TP trunk occlusion and severe disease in the tibial vessels. So initially we proceeded to, uh, from actually using our toolbox, identifying that area of severe focal calcification, we proceeded with orbital atherectomy uh, in that mid to distal SFA lesion, but it was really highly calcified. So you can, as you guys can see, uh, the balloon after that is not, you know, there's still some uh, uh, waste on the balloon. And then after this, uh, we, did not put, we did not place a filter. Uh, can you go back? No, we can't advance with that. You have to go back, please. Can you play the, the, the panel, the third panel? Thank you. Uh, so we had some distal embolization. Um, you know, again, that's when you think things are going to be easy, but <laughs> they're not. Uh, when you assume it's going to be, no, but you should always use a filter whenever possible. Um, so for this, we then gained uh, access in the peroneal artery as well. Uh, and we're able to actually cro cross all the way uh, into, the, into the pop, and we're able to treat that area and get our inline flow um, to the peroneal artery. Then we proceeded to actually place a scaffold, uh, a supera in the SFA, and as we can see, Im improve and very good luminal gain. However, there's still a waste in the distal SFA showing how bad that uh, uh, area of calcification was. Uh, and then there's good flow all the way to the uh, um, uh, to the foot, and ABI is improved post-procedure, and the wound uh, healed 
uh, post-intervention. In conclusion, vascular calcification is associated with numerous challenges in diagnosis, treatment delivery, and decreased long-term patency. And finding an effective treatment approach is important in an, in an aging population that we're in, yeah, treating increasingly with chronic kidney disease and diabetes. Many tools are available uh, to us, like atherectomy and IDL, that are available, but long-term data are needed to determine its efficacy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yolanda, I'm impressed. Uh, because your thought process is immaculately accurate and you've articulated it. I have one comment maybe for the audience and also for to be torn down if you feel incorrect. But I think Sherling has seen it in action next to me, is that when you had, in the first case, the distal guide wire and the anti-grade guide wire uh, in two different planes, there are two options. You showed us in a very good demonstration, what I call it in writings, a targeted approach, where you use the distal guide wire as a target, and you push the integrate guide wire aggressively into the true lumen. The other approach that we have done very successfully in that situation is that you, you had a point in the case where two of the guide wires were intersecting each other. At that time, what you should do, you could consider doing, of course, is leave those guide wires in those positions, take two orthogonal views, if they continue to intersect, bring the anti-grade catheter right to the point of that intersection and advance the retrograde wire straight into it. Sherling, I think uh, we have done this many, many times. What it does, it, it prevents you that angst of extending a dissection plane. Now, if you have to consider the possibility that if that guide wire would not go into the true lumen or get deflected, so just try it because what essentially that crossover point in that case is telling you is that that is the point where the true lumens, the two lumens are as close as possible to each other. So verify into orthogonal planes. You do not have to go to 45 degrees. 30 degrees is good enough. And then precisely have a ruler and you know where that level is and advance the anti-grade 035 catheter to that point and easily create the rendezvous. So sorry for taking so much time, but any other tips, uh, Alex, starting from you and Chris and Sherling and then Mehdi, any other trips, uh, tips that you use in your everyday practice where this connectivity between the two lumens, especially in the below the knee artery where you are limited by the use of major large balloon use is, is can be achieved? No, I, I don't think I have any other tricks that were, uh, that, that were previously discussed. I mean, I think um, using two balloons is, 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 a, is, a, is, is a good thing to do, but uh, no other tricks. Yeah, I have nothing to add. I don't have much more to add, except that I think it's really hard with the, when it's very calcified. Like, even when it's with the severe vascular calcification, it can be really hard to even push the 035 catheter through all of that, especially if you have a long segment SFA popliteal CTO. We've definitely had this case where we got a wire down there, but just couldn't push the 035 over the wire. And then in those cases, even though we've tried to keep a pretty small channel, I've actually had to balloon it with a very small, like a two or three millimeter balloon, just to try to get a catheter down so I could try to cannulate the catheter with the retrograde wire. But I think the vascular calcification makes it very, very difficult. It's not like your typical atherosclerosis of SFA occlusion, but that calcified artery just makes it so much more difficult for like everything else we do. Maybe a question for you. Have you ever advanced in a retrograde fashion a receiving snare? Yeah, I, I don't typically use the snares, honestly. You know, we typically use it like a guide or a, uh, or a catheter, diagnostic catheter to externalize. But I think just to highlight quickly a couple of things that uh, Dr. Castro showed is one is that when you're early career and you want to minimize the uh, complications, you got to go step by step. Sometimes you come to these meetings and you see Professor Zeller, you see... Chris White, you see, you know, uh, you know, Sherling, and you know, you you don't get the wrong impression as seeing these complicated cases. It's good to be careful. So that's one thing. The second thing is that your loop technique was uh, excellent because you didn't allow the loop to get big when you were coming retrograde. You went step by step as you were coming up the pronial to cross the uh, the popliteal. The other thing is uh, what you did and what uh, Dr. Banerjee suggested is. You know, frequently when you are not sure getting orthogonal views to make sure you're not too far from, you know, where you're supposed to be. I mean, I think all of those are just good steps uh, and good measures to be careful, especially as you don't want to have complications and you want to do these cases in a safe way. Um, and you have to somehow push yourself to do more and more complicated cases as you 
put uh, more cases under your belt. So great job. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our last, uh, it's been a great session. Uh, our last uh, case uh, of the day of this session is uh, alt alternate access options. And my good friend, uh, Nick Shamas, uh, who is going to show you, I'm sure, some very advanced cases. <laughs> <laughs> Mehdi, thank you very much. Let's see if I can get that going. All right. OK, so these are my disclosures. Okay, so why are we interested in alternate access? Of course, you've heard this uh, yesterday and today, but we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of reasons. Morbid obesity, groin infection, inability to lay flat, planned bilateral PVI, bilateral common iliac artery osteal occlusions, you, the inability to cross the lesions integratedly, bilateral common femoral artery disease, need for an integrate, retrograde, hybrid approach to treat CTOs. You know, now in OBL, same day discharge has become important. So all these are reasons why we need to learn alternate access. So we have many alternate access available. You know, the pedal, the radial are the most common, and that's what we're going to be emphasizing, you know, in the coming few minutes. But you need to learn a lot more, the integrate common femoral, SFA, you know, retrograde, popliteal retrograde, direct through stented segments, tibials, you know, whether it's integrate or retrograde, brachial, digits, plantar vessels, and profunda. So the pedal axis is ideal, of course, for CTO with convex caps or for needing a dual approach to cross the CTO. Uh, can be used for uh, non-CTO when access alternatives are not possible or difficult. Uh, very high technical success. You know, this is really a must learn for any endovascular, uh, uh, you know, individual who's going to be doing this. Decreased pro procedural and fluoro time. This has been well validated. Good early hemostasis, patient comfort, satisfaction. Uh, I always do this with ultrasound guided access, you know, some people do it with angiographic access, but I really think ultrasound guided access is really a, a very a good way to, to learn, a good technique to learn. And mid-tibial access usually is a higher complexity access, it requires a higher learning curve. I wouldn't recommend somebody just starting to do it right away. It takes at least 50 to 60 cases, you know, learning from pedal before you start doing mid, you know, type of uh, tibial access. Uh, the pedal is, you know, has been looked into since 2008, even we have data even prior to this, but this is an observational registry of 343 limbs, complex total occlusions, uh, integrated revascularization failed in 17.8%, you know, 82.2% of them were, you know, suitable for retrograde attempt, and when you start looking at the um, um, type of attempt, you know, the majority were pedal, uh, others were transcollateral. The, uh, in this particular study, the overall success rate was 86%, and only one major complication, which is a pedal access site occlusion. We know the prime data for the TAMI for, uh, the, from the TAMI technique. Uh, this is a large study, retrospective. Uh, you know, it had 744 patients, uh, 1195 uh, endovascular intervention, 101, 101 were TAMI. And the bottom line is 95% technical success. You know, the key is lowest uh, median fluoroscopy time, the procedure time was shortened, uh, the hospital stay was shorter, and the contrast uh, volume was less. So a lot of advantages there. So this is an example of a CTO of a distal SFA, uh, anterior tibialis, you know, reaching the foot, the uh, posterior tibialis is occluded. Uh, you know, the, can, you can see from the integrate crossing, you know, uh, with wire escalation, we're way off, not even close to the vessel at this point. So a pedal access was done, you know, from the um, uh, anterior tibialis, from the, and bottom line is we're able to cross uh, using an approach wire, eventually externalize the wire, you know, after exchanging it to a whisper, uh, and then via an integrate approach, you know, accomplish the uh, revascularization successfully. This is a simple uh, pedal access, you know, that can be done very easily, especially early in a person's career. You know, you could learn that very easily to do. Now, this uh, gets a little bit more complex here. You know, this is a case, you know, of a patient who've had a fem pop bypass as well as a profunda pop bypass. Both have failed. You can see the distal tibial vessels, you know, are essentially almost occluded at the uh, foot level, you know, you have uh, just a little bit of a place to, you know, get an access going, uh, and eventually decided to get two access there. We tried with the posterior tibialis, you couldn't cross, uh, got into the dorsalis pedis, you know, and we were able to get the anterior tibialis. This is the dual, uh, you know, pedal access, you know, it, 
it's something that you know we don't do very frequent but you know sometimes you can cross you know using one access and you have to use dual access in that situation uh, eventually using a, a catheter the usher catheter from bard and a crosser device the sfa occlusion was crossed but unfortunately midway we were subintimal and you can see right there close to the uh, fem uh, uh, pop uh, proximal stump you know we were right outside that so the wire was exchanged um, into a whisper wire i used actually the back end of the wire created about a 10 to 12 degree angle uh, and by using different angulation, we were able to cross into the stump, you know, and back into the common femoral, uh, something that you have to be actually cautious doing. You know, we got lucky, nothing else here. Uh, eventually, we're able to cross and dilated everything from the pedal, uh, place silver PTX stent uh, in the proximal and mid-segment, and uh, we used... Uh, um, you know, um, eventually a stent to the origin of the anterior tibialis artery, which was very severely diseased. Uh, nice uh, reconstitution to the entire uh, system with a, a flow all the way down to the foot. Uh, this is after removing, you know, the sheath at the end, and you look very nice flow all the way straight uh, in line flow to the foot. Uh, the radial has many advantages, you know, the ability to work on both legs via a single axis, the ability to approach lesions in an integrate fashion, uh, less bleeding risk. But there is some disadvantages you have to keep in mind, you know, smaller vessels, you know, uh, ten tend to be a limitation to sheath uh, size, can be a problem in type 3 aortic arch, you know, arterial spasm is a problem. Uh, radial artery loops, you know, you have to be aware of that. May be occlusive to flow to the arm, especially if you're doing very long uh, procedures. Uh, need patent uh, ulnar artery and limited treatment options that we have currently uh, for coming from the radial approach. So again, some distances you need to keep in mind. You know, let's say from the radial to the celiac, it's about 120 centimeter. Radial to the common iliac is about 140 centimeter. Radial to the proximal SFA is about 160 centimeter, and radial to popliteal 200 centimeter. You need 240 to 250 centimeters to reach from radial to all the way down to the pedals. And in fact, you know, now we do have a balloon that is 250 centimeter. It's Cermontix, actually, that they are uh, displaying this balloon right uh, behind that uh, door. Uh, so you may want to check into this. You know, from the left radial, you can actually shorten the distance by about 10 centimeter. So the available currently devices is uh, 200 centimeter, and I said now we have the 250. I just learned about that today. Uh, 400 centimeter stiff angled uh, glide wire, 260 centimeter glide wire advantages. Uh, stents up to 200 centimeter. Your orbital atherectomy device is 200 centimeter and can reach all the way to the SFA and proximal popliteal. Uh, you, longest DCB is 150, so that's not going to help you very much uh, if you have SFAs. Uh, and again, the sheath, which are available, are the 119 centimeter and 149 centimeter, uh, you know, sheath. So from radial tips, I like to use duplex ultrasound to understand the size of the radial that we have, and I'd like to see it at least two millimeter. Uh, make sure that you have flow to the ulnar artery before you poke into your radial artery. Uh, left radial access, as I said, can give you an extra 10 centimeter length, a little bit more cumbersome to work with. Uh, micropuncture needle is always used. Uh, I always use a glide sheath uh, slender, five or six. Uh, you know, I, the radial cocktail is extremely important. I use verapamil, nitroglycerin, and always heparin, you know, after you access. Uh, you know, and then uh, from uh, uh, different wires you could use, I tend to use the O35 flexible hydrophilic wire uh, with a 3 millimeter J tip. I use some LO angulation to get into the descending aorta. Uh, you could use guiding catheter if you're trying to treat the renal or the visceral vessels. Uh, of course, long sheath if you want to treat the SFA and the popliteal. So this is a, a case of a 52-year-old, you know, who had um, above uh, the knee amputation uh, on the left, and common femoral artery is totally occluded. Uh, right lower extremity now ulcerations. There is a flush occlusion of the SFA at its origin, reconstitution of the popliteal from the profunda. Uh, the access site uh, in the left common femoral artery is not possible. Uh, of course, an integrate access is not possible. It's a flush occlusion of the SFA. So we elected to do a dual access from the radial and the pedal. Uh, so um, uh, we started with a long turumo destination sheath, 118 centimeter, uh, actually 119 centimeter, inserted from the radial artery and a pedal access, you know, the right from the right dorsalis pedis. 
Uh, again, uh, we use the glide catheter, 150 centimeter, uh, over a 400 centimeter wire. You know, I'd like to take some more selective images, so we put that catheter in the profunda femoris from the radio, where injections, you know, were performed to see where the reconstitution is exactly. Uh, and then we use an angled 150 centimeter Navicross catheter advanced from the pedal sheath uh, with a 260 centimeter glide wire, uh, which uh, unfortunately ended up in the subintimal space. And you can see that wire going uh, pretty much subintimal, you know, all the way into the common uh, femoral. Uh, so in this case, um, just a little bit of remaneuvering of the wire, and, and I was actually planning to do a re-entry, uh, you know, uh, catheter here, uh, but then I decided just to go back and, and put the wire, uh, um, you know, in a different direction which we ended up, with good luck, ended up actually crossing all the way uh, with the use of an anti-grade wire and a retrograde wire and using a rendezvous technique actually in this one. Uh, and eventually from there, uh, the, um, using the pedal approach, we ended up doing uh, uh, stents, you know, using the silver PTX stent in the proximal and mid SFA while protecting the profunda femoris from the radial approach with a wire uh, into the profunda femoris. Uh, treated the whole thing with a drug-coated balloon, and then you can see there is a dissection in the common femoral artery after reconstituting everything. I decided not to leave this alone, so the proximal and mid-segment of this were stented from the pedal approach, uh, leaving the mid to distal uh, common femoral artery uh, non-stented, and that really led to a very nice result uh, with excellent flow all the way. The bottom line is alternative access is critical, you know, to ensure success of a procedure. Uh, you may have, you may need dual or triple access. Pedal and radial are gaining significant momentum. You gotta really be familiar with all the tools that you have and always anticipate complications and, and have some plan for action. Thank you. Wonderful. Nick, thank you so much. Please stay here. No, we're gonna, uh, you know, ask a few questions. We have a few minutes for discussion. So Dr. Sai, Sherlin Sai. Um, this is a complex uh, case session, and I guess what I want to ask is uh, what do you suggest or recommend in preparation to going into key these cases? Um, you know, is it a good idea to always, well, no, not always, but how often should you call a colleague? You know, if let's say your intervention is to call a surgeon, collaborate with them, do you need to get CT on all these cases and have CT planning? What do you recommend? When, you're, when you know that you may be dealing with complex cases as a preparation before going to the lab? Um, I think there are a couple things. Um, first, I usually get CTs in almost everybody. Unless they have a significant renal insufficiency, I think the preoperative CTA with runoff is, um, is really helpful. I mean, there are some cases, if, it, if I know it's all tibial, the CTA doesn't help you very much, but even to look at SFA disease, especially inflow disease, I find the CTA really beneficial. Um, in terms of case planning, I think it's important to um, sort of plan ahead what your access is going to be um, and really think about that. I mean, usually we default to doing contralateral groin access, but there are definitely cases where, you know, you want to have the better pushability coming from antegrade or from the arm and then the pedal access. Um, and like, like many of you have said, like most times you want to be prepared for pedal access even, so we just prep the foot. We don't always get pedal access first, but we always just prep the foot because it is a pain to try to prep the foot in the middle of the case. Um, so I think those are the two main things. And usually, as Dr. White said earlier, um, it's always good to have someone around. Um, so I, oftentimes I've run into the cath lab and I've had Dr. Banerjee come over to look at a case just to have another set of eyes or I'll call my partners. Um, and in extreme cases, if there's no one else, I've had someone from general surgery around. Just, so, like, just to have someone else around, you don't want to be left if the only one in the building. That's never a comfortable situation. I completely agree with you. The, none of these cases are urgent or, or emergent, right? So you have time, and this is the perfect opportunity for the vascular team uh, to meet, just like a tumor board, and, and sit around the table, look at the data that you've prepared, and say, what can you offer this patient? What can you offer this patient? What are the risks and benefits? It isn't automatically, for this level of complexity, it, it, it isn't an endo-first automatic, right? That may well be your choice, but there may be other things to consider, and, and having the buy-in and the input from your vascular team. I think, Mehdi, you wrote this paper five, four or five years ago about the benefits of the, of the vascular team. And that doesn't, it's, it's surgery, but it's also podiatry. 
Uh, it's also vascular medicine. It's also other people who would consider, um, obviously, in critical limb ischemia, medical management alone isn't going to work. But you want to optimize medical management so that whatever revascularization strategy you settle on, you get the maximum benefits of medical therapy for anti-atherosclerosis. So think about building a vascular team in your, in your clinic or your hospital so that you can take these unusual but very complex cases and get the best uh, input from everybody. Thank, thank you, uh, Chris. And uh, I was going to ask Dr. Farber, in regards to uh, prepping these patients, you know, a lot of these patients that have had uh, cabbage, maybe that have had fem pops, uh, should every patient get a vein mapping before you go to the lab? And uh, what's your overall, you know, practice uh, back home and what do you recommend uh, to folks that are non-surgeons or surgeons, you know, in the audience? So first of all, I, I just want to second what Dr. White said about having a team. You need to have a team um, that offers everything that the patient might need, including foot surgery, you know, podiatry, for, for instance, is, is, is an important component, component of the team. In terms of getting ready, you have to um, get information. It's absolutely okay to do a diagnostic angiogram and then stop if, it's a, if it turns out to be a complex case. You have to be, you have to think about what revascularization options are available. Um, uh, if surgery is a possibility, you absolutely need to uh, do vein mapping, particularly for the saphenous veins, um, and then go in there uh, w w with a plan, uh, plan A. Uh, it might be endovascular, and if you fail, then there's a plan B. But I think you have to think about this ahead of time and, and be prepared. If I could just add, I think also it's important to manage the patient's expectations. Like, we have a plan, but they have to know that there are alternative plans, too. So usually when I consent the patient, I tell them, if it's going to be a difficult case, I tell them it's possible this may just be diagnostic because we might find that there are other, other ways to fix this besides what we're going to plan for today. Nick, I have always uh, the intention to stir controversy, so I will sure. ask you a controversial <laughs> question that many of the cases presented, you've seen today, yesterday, mm -hmm. are contiguous SFA, below the knee, long cases. Mm -hmm. Now, I run a registry of contributors. I can tell you that these cases constitute 13 to 14 percent at best of the cases. Mm -hmm. So what are we really doing? Are we really doing this every day, or we should stage? So give us a fair idea. Whether it is CLI, and I think I wanted to pick up that point that every of, none of these cases are really super urgent. So even if it's critical limb ischemia, how many, what is the proportion of your cases that where you do the inflow vessels first and bring them back that solves the issues of knowing the CTA, getting ultrasound studies, and also having angiographic views from the preceding cases? So how many, what is the proportion of staged complex cases versus going to the entire thing uh, all at once? Yeah, well, you know, I would individualize, of course, every case, you know, and uh, some cases, you know, you, unfortunately, you can't just stop with the inflow when you have virtually no outflow, uh, then it will defeat the purpose because you may actually lose your inflow if you don't have very good flow downstream. Uh, so you have to, unfortunately, bite the bullet and just keep working on these cases. And, and some of those, you know, they take hours, you know, and, and some of those cases take three, four hours, you know, sometimes to, to get done. Uh, on the other hand, if you feel like you have, you know, reasonably good collaterals, you know, and you're going through a CTO in the FEMPOP, you know, and you treated this and it's been a long procedure, I have no problem staging that at all, you know, and in fact, we know some data even supports the fact that some of those patients may do just fine, you know, and, and uh, maybe their uh, Rutherford Becker 4 becomes a 3 or a 2, and you can add silostazole and exercise and get away without even adding procedures down the road. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, um, staging is not a bad thing, you know, as long as you individualize the case and you determine that whatever you have done during that procedure was sufficient enough, you know, to get things, you know, going okay for that patient. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question, um, and just want to thank all the speakers for staying on time. Uh, the question is regarding knowing the tools in the lab, and uh, we are having, you know, in some locations, folks are having trouble with supply chain. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. White. Uh, what is your advice, Dr. White, in regards to the early career folks that may be going to a new place maybe working in a lot of uh, hospitals now have system, uh, systems. 
and they have a community hospital, they have a main hospital, and some of the places, locations may not have all the tools. What, what should we do if I'm a young interventionist surgeon and I'm gonna start a practice, they send me to this facility, you know, uh, you know 45 minutes away, what, what are your recommendations and suggestions? Unfortunately, I think you have to be willing to move. <laughs> um, the way that healthcare is working out these days is that physicians tend to not have nearly as much leverage as we used to have 10 or 15 years ago. And so sometimes you may find yourself in a community hospital that isn't very supportive of you or your goals. Um, you know, we have Zola Nandu, uh, who is a fellow that I trained 15 years ago, who has a passion for critical limb ischemia. He works in one of our community hospitals in New Orleans, and he does a great job. He's got a, a, a built up a podiatry team and, and a vascular team. He does extremely advanced cases, DVAs and other things. But on a quarterly basis, my um, administrative folks in that area try to shut him down because his wire use is out of proportion to what other community cardiologists wire use. So they see that he's using three or four times as many 014 wires per case as the other doctors. And, and so they're thinking he needs to be punished. And I say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, these aren't coronary cases. These are complex peripheral cases. We want these done. This is important to him to do this for his career. So you, if you're in that position and you don't have me to protect you, then you need to be willing to come work at Oxnard in New Orleans and I'll protect you. <laughs> that's, good. And that's really why I asked Dr. White. I think there are two things here, you know, in, in summary, Subash, if you will. In summary, I think there are two lessons, at least for me, from this session, aside from the, all the tips and tricks that we learned. One is that you want to be in an environment that is multidisciplinary. If you work in a place that you are isolated, you don't have people that are willing to step up and help you, you're going to be lonely, it's going to be stressful, and it's, going to be, it's not going to be fun. And the second thing is that you want to be in an environment that you have support, and there are folks that understand what you're going through when you're doing these complex cases, these three, four hour cases, and that you know you can get the support of the of your leaders uh, to, for you to be able to do these advanced cases. Anyway, Subhash, you get the last word. No, fantastic. I think this has been a great session, and I want to say that the idea here was uh, to get a deep dive into mm -hmm. uh, these steps and decision making, because ultimately, as Mary says, these sometimes are more deterministic than the case itself, than the technique and the wire itself. And I still see Dr. Sai in. I've been working with her for like 17 years, or 15, uh, 12 years, 10, 10 years. I worked, I worked, no, 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 I worked 19 years, she, I worked with her for 12, but she's still before the case, she goes around the hospital on the cath lab in the OR and collects all the equipment that is needed for the case and puts it in the OR. Mm -hmm. And right. I mean, this is amazing uh, work ethic, and I think that allows us to plan for the case, yes. decide what to be done, and all the other contingency measures that will come. I think that kind of work ethic is probably what we are celebrating today, and I think what is the basis for all your success. Yeah, so, and what Dr. Seller you. said is, is important. CTA, CTA are very important. It makes you plan your case really well. Thank you, Thank so you very much. much. Yes.